So, so well, that's speaking for the session with uh, Christian. And uh, yeah, usually we, we know Juan uh, over uh, UDP. Um, and he will um, will present us um, ways some other transports talk well. Um, yeah, let's see what we can. And also, it's in trouble if you're the one from the house. Can I, can I throw this screen share? Sure, sure, sure. You just have to spend any more of your And then I'll. So, and then the uh, screen. Sorry. So, and I'll just share that again. Ah, yeah. yeah, I think that looks better. <laughs> that should be good. Yep, I think. Oh, are we good to go? Um, which one do I take? Okay. Um, so sorry for the technical trouble. Um, my name is Sister Amsis. Um, you'll find me as Chrism on metrics, etc. And yeah, as I told, um, I'd like to talk about what we can use co-op over. Given that uh, co-op has been a topic of, um, that was um, covered in the last two presentations, I skipped the first question about who of you has heard co-op. <laughs> um, but I'd like to ask instead, who of you has been using co-op in some form or other? Show hands, please. Well, okay, that's like, like more than half. Um, has anyone of you used co-op or anything that is not uh, UDP or DTLS? Okay, that's one. One, 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 one hand, um, but that means I'll cut the uh, introduction of co-op quite short because you already know what it does and um, if any of that raises questions that haven't been covered in the previous presentations, I think um, please just let me know or interrupt me if anything is out here during the presentation. Yeah, um, I've been talking about co-op on and off for the last summit. Um, so that's a screenshot of 2021 showing me showing a screenshot of 2018. <laughs> and um, being the lazy person I am, I'm also reusing my slides. Um, but, I, <laughs> uh, but I've updated things a bit um, to, to stay current. So um, the, on the application side, on the top, so this is stack diagram, um, of all things, uh, all things, of Part of the things that you can do over co-op, that can be administration, that can be configuration. Uh, there are lots of tools that help you implement your applications, and there are many, many transports um, below um, co-op that you can use, especially because it's heading out through the internet protocol. Um, so while in other presentations I've focused on the applications or on security components, today I'd like to focus on this part here, being uh, the various transports you can use co-op over. And actually that uh, stack diagram is a bit incomplete because what I've focused on in the past talks 
uh, was co-op over um, IP-based transports, which admittedly is the most um, common use case. But there are other specified. So for example, co-op over SMS or over narrowband IP um, has been specified uh, by the Lightweight M2M uh, as part of Lightweight M2M standard. Um, and co-op will be at least something that I'm personally working on. So to take things on from this figure, um, uh, just know that uh, the, the x-axis here has no particular meaning, so this is just a collection of things you can run co-op over. But if we slice right horizontally through here, we could see things uh, this way and know that there are way more transports um, that have at least been considered uh, than were shown on the previous slide. We we'll ignore for the next few steps um, the, the vertical axis here, uh, but on the horizontal axis, this um, covers things starting from things that have been specified in the IPF as RFCs uh, over to uh, lightweight end to end specifications, which cut a few corners, which is why I'm not setting them as like full co op backends yet, over to internet drafts, that, some of which have been around for several years. Um, this also covers things like the unit sockets that are not specified in that way, but more implemented and used by, for, for this particular example, uh, libcoop internally, and a few others on the, on the bottom right side um, that were primarily done in scientific research, where the papers are a bit vague on what precisely is going on with the transport, but that's not the precise point. It also covers several things that were mentioned in, in publications on that topic as Things one might do if there if there ever arises need. To illustrate how different um, transports interact with each other, I'd like to start with a figure that I make from the uh, 2021 presentation, um, illustrating how in how applications that use common transport interact. So on the top left here, we have a device that is talking co op over UDP. And on the bottom right, we have an application that we are interacting with, and they are connected, and they have shared interfaces. Of course, in between there, uh, you often have a router. And if we take a closer look at what this look, what happens inside that router, um, we'll see that that UDP part, and maybe I'll just add the labels for the interfaces because often the stacks and the interfaces kind of are mixed in, in their terminology. Um, so we see that the co-op interface that the application builds on. And that is like what it defines, the resources, the requests that it sends out, um, is mapped through the co-op implementation onto UDP, which by the UDP stack is mapped onto IPv6, which is transported, for example, uh, over 60 down to an 802.15.4 radio. What the router does is it decapsulates that last layer, sends for, does forwarding on the IP layer, which is what the IP layer is really good for and sends it out over an originally incompatible interface and up the whole stack to the application. If we are now looking, for example, at Coop over SMS, we don't have that IP layer or any lower layer um, that we could uh, transport this over. So we're having the same device, but our peer device is now using Coop over SMS, for example, because it has hardware access to some, uh, to some cellular network gateway, uh, cellular network, a component that can send SMS. And I, frankly, I haven't looked up all the acronyms down there, so it just says three-letter acronym uh, for, or quad-letter acronym uh, for all, because there's a lot of stuff going on in that part of the stack on the cellular side, but um, it is fairly relevant here. So what a co-op proxy does is it doesn't try to go down to those layers, but instead it forwards information right on the co-op layer. So the core application, on a, from a high-level point of view, talks to a proxy that does the same thing that a router does on the IP layer, but just on, a, on the core request response layer. And that request can then be forwarded through the proxy to that other device. If we look at the full stack, this looks rather much more complicated because that core is encapsulated down to UDP sent through 6 stage, possibly passes a router, unpacked to the proxy, packed again, and sent to the device. But the important thing to notice is that for the devices themselves, this is no more complicated than using routed, routed co-op. It just means that they have to set up that proxy uh, and find that point. 
Sure, they will then rely on that discovery of the proxy, and they will rely, they will require the presence of a proxy. But otherwise, they couldn't talk at all. So I'd say that's a win. Of course, um, this is a bit of an extreme example because I've picked one where there is no underlying IP layer um, that could be reused. So if I pick the more adversarial example, um, we could be looking at uh, some one device talking core over UDP, whereas another device might be talking core over TCP. And those could be connected. So you could try sending a request from, a, a, say, from the application uh, through the network to the network uh, to the IP address of that device, but that connection would be refused and things would just go awry. Even though, if the components use the right interfaces, things could have worked. So taking from taking from the um, using that to look into what are the issues, we can see. To uh, one main thing that is fragmentation of the ecosystem, and that is, I think, the most um, prominent part that is always being brought up uh, when it comes to um, when it when it comes to using code over different proxies. Uh, there's one more issue that I'd like to cover very briefly because I can refer you to other uh, to the 2021 presentation on the topic that is security, and I'll make that very short. Um, co-op proxies are really great at handling that because we, um, in co-op we don't only have DTLS, which would be if we did proxying as we do in HTTP, terminated at the proxy. We'll be using some proxy that is not really a proxy but more some kind of a tunneling mechanism. But we also have end-to-end -end security, so we can have a request sent by a device, um, protected with OSCOR, sent down to say co-op or UDP. And when that traverses the proxy, the proxy only sees ciphertext and information that is relevant to forwarding. And the actual decryption happens at the end after having passed through any kind of, um, through any other kind of code transfer. Um, so when, when in look, looking at the, the last two presentations you've seen, um, the main advantage there was uh, the, the size um, advantage of OSCO requests and the speed advantage. Here you see that it's also really important in order to do end-to-end -end, end -end security. Um, now coming back to the topic of fragmentation, um, I've colored the individual transports uh, depending on how much this is actually an issue. So if we look, for example, at um, COA or SPI or one wire, there is not even a specification that would allow us to use, uh, to use IP over that. Um, for SMS, you could argue that, hey, you could use GPRS, but that's not in or one of the more modern standards, but that's not available on all hardware like, interfaces. So um, may, may be a problem, maybe not. Um, with things like uh, co uh, co uh, co over a GAT, that is a Bluetooth Low Energy, or narrowband IoT, you could argue that, well, instead of using that particular layer, you could use the same radio interfaces. Um, to you um, and, and go through another layer, so, uh, through, through an actual IP layer, so that would at least be an option. Um, but co-op over SLIP or WebSockets doesn't immediately have any excuse because it, on, on first glance, it just creates an interoperability, interoperability hazard and fragmentation. But if we look a bit closer to why those are, why those are used, there are good reasons to use each of them, or um, at least most of them. Uh, so, for example, um, Unix sockets in libcoop are used because there is no easy way for two applications that are loosely coupled to exchange co-op uh, requests on the same host without going through the network interface and requiring some secure some securing, even if it's through the loopback interface, because the loopback interface is usually available to all users. Um, so that would be Unix sockets um, for co-op over web sockets and co-op over GAT. Um, Technically, it's easily possible to use um, co-op over UDP in one case, or in the case of GAT, um, use the IP, um, IP service profile of BLE to create a six low pan network over BLE and transport requests through there. But the majority of cases where it's really relevant to use one of those two options are when the application is sitting in the browser or at least in an operating system um, that is more constrained with respect to what an application may actually access than, for example, Linux. So 
Uh, to my knowledge, it's not possible even to implement IPSP without kernel support on Android. And kernel support means kind of breaking the whole Android system. Um, or my, one of my favorite examples, um, web core applications can well be written for a web browser. But then the application is running inside a web browser, and the only interfaces that application sees to the outside world are web sockets, HTTP requests, and provided that the right web extensions are implemented in your browser of choice, um, maybe uh, core, uh, maybe uh, maybe Bluetooth Low Energy Gas or Web USB. Um, but even though technically you would be on a device that is capable of using it. You're in an environment in which you cannot start using core or GDP at all. So I think it is quite legitimate to claim that um, in such situations, this is not an interoperability hazard, but this is enabling a direction of communication that was previously unavailable. Uh, to, so to summarize this, I would like to claim that um, if you have the option to use core over UDP or core over DTLS, please by all means do. If there are good reasons not to, for example, because you need to traverse a firewall or if you're in a heavily firewall environment where you only get TCP through, or if you, uh, if you transport so much data that, uh, that, you, that the flow control of core becomes inefficient and, you, and TCP is better, um, then any of those transports can enable those use cases. Those use cases. Uh, before I go into a few of the um, transport in more detail, um, I'd like to take a look at how all of this can be used and how this can be useful uh, with rivals. So um, the current situation is that we have good support for co-op over UDP in Rav, and uh, thanks to the Socket API, we can use the same applications with the same co-op stack implementations also over TTLS. But I think that a lot of the others would be useful, and that is, uh, that is for two kinds of applications. One application is that RAV, I think, especially on the a tad larger devices, so say NRF, uh, NRF 52 and larger, um, would make a very good um, instance of an edge device that can provide this proxying, for example, because it has a BLE interface and an 802.54 interface and maybe a, um, an Ethernet interface. Um, but possibly more importantly, one area where Riot really shines is portability. You can write a Riot application that uses the abstractions that we have and then take a completely different board than what you originally developed this for, take that application, build it with that other board, and it still does something useful. And I think that here we can, this, this should also work for co-op. So if you are having, if you're building a device that only has a uh, very limited uh, USB connectivity. Yep, why not take the application that you originally wrote for an Ethernet-based device and run it there? If your, if your device has just, has just BLE, possibly even a chip that doesn't uh, uh, allow you to run advanced profiles, you could run Cobol co 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 get there. Um, so the application cannot change, but your, client, your clients and your peers can still stay unmodified even if that peer is a web browser application that is now just being switched from uh, Kobo over, uh, over GAT to Kobo over web USB. Um, for how, how hard that is to, to add to RAV, I'd like to come back to the, to the figure I've shown before and now focus on that y-axis. Kobo over DTLS by, uh, over UDP by its very definition is highly similar to Kobo over UDP. Um, <coughs> By contrast, uh, COP over TCP uses a completely different uh, framing format. So even if you had some kind of socket where you could put the same data in that you put into a UDP socket, as you can do with UDP and ETLS, um, you would need to, to actually prepare different, uh, different messages and prepare those messages differently. Um, in some cases, like in TCP and TLS and OSCOR, uh, that doesn't only refer to the, uh, to the framing, uh, but also even to the options inside. So let's have a look at some of the details here. Coop over UDP. <laughs> Apparently, it's based on UDP. And the header um, consists of about four bytes plus, plus, plus token of some length. 
contains item, it contains a message type, it contains the request code that is get post put or changed um, bad gateway, etc. It contains a 16-bit message ID and the request token. Uh, UDP is unreliable, so co-op does all the uh, things that you need to um, to transport a uh, message reliably, uh, if so requested. And it also takes makes sure that if there is a situation where the order of um, messages matters, that is handled. For example, in the observe option, um, which is something, um, if you're not familiar with it, think of it as a get with an additional promise that the server will tell the client whenever there is some new value there. Uh, that option in Kobo or UDP uh, carries a numeric value because UDP is unordered, so it has to be uh, taken care of. Kobo or Serial um, was, if you remember that, somewhere in the middle up there. Um, that um, it's also called Slipnox because that is, it's multiplexed with Slip. This runs on a on a serial line, so typically the thing where you where you could also run Ethernet over serial, um, but just in a in a more standardized way. Um, jumping back and forth here, oh, okay, there's some alignment mismatch. Uh, you'll see that it carries identical header items, um, so it's really the same messages, but as an as small extra, um, it also contains at the end of the payload extra two bytes that uh, work as a checksum because that slip lower layer doesn't have its own checksumming built in. So the message that has to be prepared is subtly different, might be managed by some wrapper in, on a socket API, so maybe you could send it, but there, there, are, there, are, there are some limits. Also, it has, I think, uh, yeah, I, what I missed to put in there, there's probably also a length field in the front because, uh, but, so, I, I, at least there are those two extra bytes. Code over TCP uh, looks quite different. A, it has to explicitly indicate the length, and B, it doesn't have to carry all those that information about um, acknowledgements and, and retransmission because that is what TCP takes care of. So the header looks different, and not only does the header look different, it also uses the, reliable, uh, the, the ordering guarantees of TCP um, to eliminate those extra, that extra information that in an observation is carried around uh, as a numeric value. So even the, even the options that are added into that message are changed. And to give one final example, uh, Coop or GAT um, has an even more exotic um, baseline layer because the reliability guarantees of GAT are unidirectional. So, and, and, and then again, we get ordering. So the header items can be slid down to one byte plus the code plus the token because that is what is suitable for that particular transport. Um, just because I see that I'm not um, limit, not running into a time limit, any any other transports you would be interested in? Maybe to say <laughs> questions now while I have the slide on. <laughs> Hmm? Laura? Quick. Sorry? Laura? Okay, uh, Laura first, quick. Um, Laura is something that is part of the library and specification. Uh, they um, largely use co-op co as it is over UDP with all the uh, with all the header fields in the same way as they were um, as they are specified for UDP, but they have a few extra semantics baked in for empty requests because they are handled by some part of the network infrastructure. Objection to that question. Um, is this actually using some stuff of shape or just the core header and nothing else? Um, I'm not sure. I've skimmed the Laura one specification, um, but I haven't read it or implemented it. Um, I'd have to look it up. I think it's just the very good top of Laura one. With the same thing. It's just, uh, okay. I mean, I mean, you don't have to use IP for SHIG, you can just yeah. use the SHIG compression with the core patterns. They, they, they could well use it, but it, it might easily be that they just send things as they are um, in the first instance. Um, coming back to Corbo real quick, um, it's not specified completely. What they are doing is they are, um, so this is, this is from a uh, print and bundle are from research papers. Um, they are basically taking the, the TCP transport, so they are, they are 
inheriting all the rules of the TCP layer um, and just um, using the additional performance um, of TCP uh, of Quick. And what they are also doing is that they um, they open a different, I think the term is channel in Quick, um, basically it's a different sub connection for every request so they don't suffer from head line logging. At which point they could have easily done away with the need for tokens in the header. Um, which they have chosen not to do, which makes sense for research paper. Um, so if this were specified, I would guess that the, 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 the resulting protocol would look like a bit of a hybrid between code over TCP and code, uh, it, would, it would look largely like code over TCP, but it would be the first specified protocol that does not need co-op tokens because it has the stream identifiers. And I would be very glad to review that because I'm, it's, it's like a bit of a pet peeve of me that not all co-op transports would necessarily need to have a token, and that would be a great example. So on the right side, um, what would we need to, to get there? Um, one thing is that traditionally we've been, um, I wouldn't say sloppy, I'd say um, efficient, <laughs> um, about um, accessing, uh, pri accessing feeds that maybe were not intended to be public, uh, in interfaces, so all the details such as like where 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 are the where are the where are the bits and pieces of the core header, um, those those APIs would need to be either deprecated or limited to to UDP cases. Um, we would need a bit of metadata about the transport that is being used, made available to the applications, so that they can make the decisions that influence. Um, options such as observe that have different um, behaviors on different transports. Um, and we would need to um, open up a bit on the, on, in the area of how do we express addresses because really uh, an address, a co-op address on Slipmux is just an interface identifier. Uh, and on Bluetooth Low Energy it's um, either a MAC address or even a handle that was given to you by your by, by your BND stack. And I think that should be achievable using a, a driver-like model for co-op transport, so that when you have a packet, um, you get the some payload pointer and some B table pointer, and then adding options, etc., uh, dispatches into that. Some work has already been done there, so the number of, of field accesses to things like token have been reduced already quite a bit. Um, but yeah, there's. A, I think this should be achievable in, 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 in the next year. So maybe on the next summit, we'll see core, uh, we see core device, uh, RAP devices uh, talking over an interface they have already. Yeah, um, I hope some of you will try that out together with me. And let's see how far we get until the next summit, which I hope will happen in my hometown, Vienna. <laughs> let's, see, let's see what we have by then. Thank you. <laughs> if we don't have that one, ask a question, I'll really the question. Um, how would you get the extra information that you're needing for the special transport proxy the connection? That's connected. So, uh, the question was how do I have the extra information about for, for how to, to how to proxy something? So if I understand the question right, that is related to if I send a request to a proxy, how does the proxy know where to forward? Is that the it's it's more like uh, if you need a transport uh, stream number, uh, like like the token number. If you need the yeah. token number, you yeah. don't need the token number for something else. Then there's a proxy in, in between. This has to keep track of the connection. So, um, so, 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 still not quite sure. So, is that about what the proxy does or what the client does? Uh, or what the, what the endpoint does? Um, yes. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's good. Uh, uh, it's on. It's on. It's on. Yes. Okay. Um, the if you are, if you establish a connection between a device that has uh, that does not need a token for some reason, or that does not need to keep uh, track of the uh, 
of the connection because it's TCP. And you forward to something that needs to keep track of the connection because it's UDP or yeah. it needs a token because uh, where is this stored? So this is only stored in the proxy because the, 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 end, the end device sends the request through, say, some TCP connection and it will expect the response to come back through that TCP connection. And that is part of, in, in, on the route side, that would be essentially part of the data that is associated with that request. So for example, if that, that packet pointer would go to something uh, that contains some socket, some socket handle. On the proxy side, um, every proxy that forwards a request needs to keep the state to respond around associated with whatever forwarding information it has. So if that request comes in from the top, from the top here, let's, let's say that button thing is, is quick, quick, quick for sake of, of talking about tokens. Um, then the request comes in here with a token and the proxy starts and starts, the proxy needs some state for at least the duration of the request. So that state would contain the token and network address where that request was received from and it would be pointed to by that um, by the request by that request that is being sent out over quick. And once through that request response coming back, that that the the, the the arrival is triggered, the arrival response is triggered. That looks up um, what the what the net what the kind of forwarding information in the other direction was. That will find that the network address and the token and send that back. And use that to send back the message. Okay, and how, if, um, if if you're if if you're coming from the information centric network, that would be like like the interest yeah. being consumed. I don't know if you're one of the people working with that. Uh, it's more. Is it? Yeah. Um, it's more like um, if the, if you have this uh, information stored, then can you forget it again? Um, yes, you can forget. <laughs> um, I have a draft on that. <laughs> um, so unless something different has been negotiated, there is exactly one response to a request. So the response comes back in, and that consumes the forwarding information. If, for example, by means of using the observe option, it has been negotiated that this um, that this request stays open for longer. Then that needs to be known to the proxy because every option that introduces that every option that opens up the possibility of sending multiple responses um, needs to be of an option kind that is critical for the proxy to understand. Co-op has uh, the option numbers in co-op are structured, and there is one bit about whether the endpoint needs to understand it or can just ignore it and one bit about whether the proxy needs to understand this. And there are so-called proxy unsafe options, which if the proxy doesn't support them, the proxy will terminate right away and say, sorry, I can't do that. And any request that asks for multiple responses needs to be understood by the proxy. And then all parties involved will agree that this is a longer running request. And until whatever condition is, is described in that option, occurs, that thing will stay open. Okay. <laughs> Very good question. Thank you. <laughs> Any more questions? Um, one, one brief, if there's no more questions, one brief addendum. Um, if the thing that things are going in the other direction, it is possible to do the proxy statelessly because, um, and, and that it's a bit of a niche application, but there are good reasons to do it. If you want to have a completely stateless proxy, there is an option to use a very large token. And that large token can contain a um, pretty pleasing trip because otherwise you're wide open for other things, um, expression of whatever your internal state is that you need to recover to send that information back. This is, for example, used when you're setting up a six-dish network, and a lot of then, then a lot of devices are joining, and initially they can only start to their immediate neighboring node. That neighboring node has to rate limit what it forwards to the join uh, to the joint coordinator. Um, but that neighboring node is not in a position to store any state because it's one of the most constrained devices that are around. Ah.
that are around. <laughs> um, okay. So that in that situation, you would typically use that trick to do away with the state, packet everything up, and by the time you get the response, not packet again. Then the uh, device needs to know it's proxied, and so right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are reverse proxies. Yes. Can you can you jump again to the stack figure so we can take a new picture for the next presentation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, almost rather. Uh, I think that's the current one. That one. <laughs> you need to link less. The fractal one is better. Right? The fractal one is better. <laughs> We have a session. We have half an hour of uh, coffee break and then we will meet again for the system.